man to do that today, so <laughs> just saying. <laughs> A lucky man in New York managed to get his hands on my ass. And TSA, TSA. <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah, stupid shit I did back in the, the army. And then get back to the Air Force as a reservist because they figured, uh, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. Let's give him more work to do. Um, but the, the neat thing about it is that most of my career, career I've been focused on the offensive side of security. Uh, I, was, I was and still am a red teamer. Uh, for a long time, I was focused on military, government, financial, a private sector, red teaming, a, you name it. And you're probably wondering, what the hell is this guy doing here talking about threat intelligence, which is mostly a defensive practice designed to help defenders stop attacks or, or be better prepared for attacks so they can deal with them a little better. Uh, well, here's the deal. When you're doing offensive security, the stuff that really pays uh, uh, your your wage is helping after you're done, you know, playing around and fooling around and, and breaking stuff. Uh, what really pays you is fixing it. And there's a whole lot more work in fixing stuff from the defensive posture than from breaking it, breaking into it over the course of a few days or a few weeks. So this is kind of a talk that summarizes a lot of the defensive work that, uh, that I did in the past. Uh, I would say six to eight years, uh, when I had a chance to work with uh, large organizations or interesting organizations. And uh, a lot of that work, we were implementing uh, threat intelligence capabilities before threat intel became the, the big buzzword that sells millions of dollars of products and uh, RSS feeds. But before we go into threat intel, uh, we need to understand where that fits. Threat intel doesn't work for everyone. Uh, you can't just go off and buy threat intelligence. I mean, you can, and uh, the only thing that it's going to give you is, is a good feeling and a, a big hole in your budget. Uh, threat intel comes in to play for organizations that have the right security posture and have the right maturity to be able to practice threat intelligence. Uh, and to do that, in the next 15, 20 minutes, we're going to go over the basics of how do you get there or what do you need to have before you say, I want threat intel, because everyone has it. So first things first, threat modeling. Okay, uh, You cannot buy or use threat intelligence if you don't know what your threat model is. And threat modeling is hard, uh, and it will require a lot of whiteboarding and meetings and planning and documentation and just what we call work. I know it's hard for us to understand, uh, it's not. It's not in uh, in Metasploit. It's not in Kali. It's on whiteboards and Word documents. But once you get it done, you'll see how it really helps you with your defensive posture and your uh, overall security uh, practice. So, threat modeling basically. And, and again, this is not a talk about threat modeling. So I'll blow through this. Um, we have three main practices of, of uh, threat modeling or, or approaches. The first one is attacker focused, where we look mainly at the attackers, at, at our you know, threat actors or threat communities, and try to derive what, what's their interest. What do they see? How do, how do they apply to me? Uh, and, and focus most of the, of the model on the attacker side. Um, the, second, the second school is the software focused threat modeling. This is probably what you're more familiar with in the forms of uh, Stride and Dread. Um, and it's fun, it's okay, it's, it's, it's applicable sometimes. It's applicable usually for software development, less than for organizational security. Okay, so let's put that in context and, and leave it for, for later on. And the third approach is asset focused. You look first on your assets, what am I trying to protect, right? What am I get, getting paid to do? as a security analyst, as, a, as an IT security guy, as a, a hacker, whatever it is, and kind of uh, grow out of there in terms of, of building a threat model. Um, so again, just to mention Stride and Dread and all those models, they're great for software development, not very applicable when you try to put things in perspective because what they're usually missing are the two, the two big pieces of, of uh, threat modeling, which is the processes and the people. 
okay? Which is, unfortunately, uh, uh, the big piece of what most organizations uh, have. We can't run any, everything in software so far. What the hell? No. Okay. Woo. What happened? Everything's broken. Whoops, sorry. We're back. Okay. <clears throat> um, and the third one, as I said, is asset focused. You look first of all on your assets. What are the crown jewels of the organization? Ask that question to the CEO, to the CFO. What keeps you up at night? What pays your paycheck? Uh, and let me give you a hint. It's not a server. It is not a database, all right? It is not a technical thing that you can say, this is, you know, this is my asset. The server is not an asset. Information that just happens to be stored on the server may be an asset. Okay, so stop thinking like techies for a second and think like hackers that are trying to break into the organization. Information may be stored in a tape. It may be stored in a vault. Okay, I've seen organizations keep their, their crown jewels on printed binders inside a vault. Okay, that's an asset. It's a way to do it. Uh, so again, build a threat model or, or think about your threat model in the sense of assets and attackers. That's the, that's the beginning. And that's going to enable you to move, move on to the next step and start thinking, all right, so who are those attackers? Okay, who are those, what, what we call them in the threat modeling world, uh, threat communities? Okay, uh, is it crazy Russian hackers? Is it crazy Chinese hackers? Is it my CEO? All right, it could be an insider threat. Is it uh, my partner? Is it, is it the business itself? Is it competitors? Again, that discussion should leave the IT security world. All right, that discussion should happen on a whiteboard when you talk to a CEO, a CFO, a COO, people who actually, whose job is actually to uh, run the risk of the company, operate under a certain amount of risk, they know what that organization faces in terms of who's out there to get me. What's going to get me fired? And just as interesting, uh, what might get me in jail? Uh, so think about that. Uh, and again, it's, it's not going to be, you know, you can't just buy this. This is work that you have to do. You have to sit down with the organization. If they haven't done it before, guess what? We need to do that. Uh, when we look at threat actors or threat communities, remember to, at a minimum, create enough information about them or gather enough information about them so you can apply it later to your threat intelligence. That's critical. If you don't do that, you're going to get sucked into the whole vortex of threat intel buzzword and buy some, some bullshit product from a vendor that's not going to give you any value. All right? You need to be armed with the right questions, with the right focus, so you can create a threat intel practice around it. Uh, so at a minimum, look at capabilities. What is my threat actor capable of? All right? Are, are they, again, crazy Russian hackers that can uh, bug into this room without be, even being here? Or is it uh, uh, my CEO, who's less technical savvy, but has access to everything in my company? And with a tweet, can destroy this company. Uh, what's their motivation? Okay, what drives them to try to get into my critical assets? Uh, what's their accessibility? Again, if it's an insider, is it the janitor that walks over every night, walks around every night, that can plug USB, plug USB keys into all, all my uh, laptops? Or is it, again, some, the, the, the APT, whatever, from China that are trying to hack my, my cybers uh, and SCADA every day? Uh, and what's their MO? Again, you are not going to be, shocker, I know, you're not going to be the first one who's going to get attacked. Okay? Other people, our organizations, have went through this, and we can learn a lot from the uh, previous attacks. So try to study the MO. Try to study the, the modus operandi of those attackers so you can start digesting that information and then turn it into a, a focused threat intelligence. Uh, effort. Second thing, look at your assets. Okay, again, identify where they are in the organization. Who has access to them? What kind of processes involve those assets? How do they get created? 
How do they get modified? How do they get used inside our organization? Um, again, identify people that has, have access to those assets. And then identify the technology and the controls that we have around those. At this point, again, you'll, you'll see a lot of things from an organizational perspective. And um, here's another cheat sheet for you. A lot of times you'll go, oh my God, you don't have database APT cyber protection on your MySQL or, or MS SQL or whatever it is. But they might have process controls that stop that data from being uh, breached or modified. And it's okay because the company, companies do know, regardless of what we think, how to operate under risk or under, under threats. And companies do know, you know, before we had computers, we were doing accounting on, I don't know, abacus and, and paperwork and stuff like that. And there are checks and balances. And a lot of times, you're going to want to focus all your might on putting that fancy new database protection or uh, advanced anti-APT firewall. Do you really need it? Do you, do you have compensating controls that mitigate the risk on the way to that asset. Take that into account. That's why you're doing homework and threat modeling. So by this point, you should have a pretty good picture about who are the threats, what their capabilities are, what's the accessibility, kind of a threat profile from, from the attacker perspective, and a good perspective on what my assets are. Where do they reside? What kind of controls and protections are built around them? What kind of processes and people touch them and technology? Uh, and at that point, we can start talking about threat intelligence. So as I promised, we're 13, 13 minutes in, and I'm saying, and this is the, the first time we're looking at threat intel. So before we have threat intelligence, again, all right, it's important to distinct between threat intelligence and just data. Um, let's talk about collecting intelligence. All right, before it becomes intelligence, you need to gather it somehow. Uh, and again, everyone can shove a list of URLs and MD5 down your pipe, um, but you should ask yourself, what's in it? And how can I use it? If your answer is, oh, just update my antiviruses and, uh, and firewalls and, and URL filtering, ask again, but why doesn't my antivirus and firewall and you're all filtering, already have access to this list of MD5s and hashes, okay, and URLs. Good question, right? Um, ask your vendor that and maybe avoid paying for that list of MD5s and URLs. Uh, we're looking for relevant information. Only relevant information can turn into intelligence. Otherwise, it's just generic threat data. Uh, don't pay for that, please, for God's sake. There are kids around here, I'm really trying. <laughs> so what do I collect in order to make this matter to me and not just another signature list that should have existed in my AV? Well, again, go back to your threat model. First of all, the most element, the, the element that is most relevant to you are your specific threats. So look at your threat actors. If you are uh, afraid of MI5 or the, the Russian uh, uh, spy agencies, that's one threat actor. If you are afraid of your local competition here in uh, Indianapolis because you run you know, some small tech shop or a bakery uh, or a, a hotel, that's a completely different threat actor. That's a competitor. It has different access, it has, it has different methodologies, it has different capabilities. Uh, obviously, when you look at those threat actors, the, uh, the areas or the data that you, can get, that you need to gather about them is completely different. Okay, I can't go to a vendor and say, here are my threat actors, you know, give me all the data about uh, uh, the Hyatt across the street because they're stealing my, my customers here. They're going to go, like, what? We're selling threat intelligence. Here's a list of MD5s. <laughs> no. Uh, give me threat intelligence. Give me data that's relevant to me. Again, look at your uh, threat model, identify the attackers, and start collecting 
intelligence about your threat communities. Understand, and again, what are you trying to get back? Not a list of MD5s or, or URLs. You're trying to get back motivation, accessibility, capabilities, techniques, okay? Relevant data for that specific threat actor. The next building the onion or peeling the onion, doesn't matter how you look at it, is industry specific. So we talked about, you know, the West in here and the Hyatt across the street. Is there a Hyatt across the street? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I saw a Wi-Fi, I was like, ah, someone's shitting with me. <laughs> Apparently it's the Hyatt. Um, so we went from a specific competitor, okay, threat actor, to the general industry. Who's attacking hotels? What's, you know, the latest buzz in hospitality? Who's been breached and why? And again, most of that data is accessible online, okay? You have your industry sector news that you can tap into. You might have vendors that have, you know, that, that are running, that have analysts to provide that information. There are a lot of different sources for your specific industry. And guess what? It's gonna be way more applicable to you as a potential threat that might impact you as well than some generic, oh, here's a, here's a, oh, I, I love this. Here's Dooku 2, okay? Your AV signatures have been updated to protect you from Dooku 2. Guess what? None of you are gonna be hit with Dooku 2 unless you're like super shady or actually go out to find the file. You are not the target for a nation state, maybe. <laughs> okay, but if you're in the hospitality business and someone is hitting hotels to collect information about special guests, VIPs, uh, areas of interest, whatever it is, you might be a target. You might want to get that into your threat model. Last but not least, yes, you still need the general threat intel. Uh, unfortunately, this is most of what you'll get from threat intelligence vendors these days. Okay, uh, so put that in context, and the next time you get a pitch from a threat intel vendor, you know, show them this and ask them where where are you give what are you giving me exactly? Because if you're giving me this, lolcats, I'm not paying you. All right, give it to me for free because this is very generic. Yes, it will have some impact on me because I have employees who will click on you know grumpy cats. And, uh, and infect themselves with some random malware. But it's not really direct, okay? It's kind of a tertiary threat that I still need to deal with and I still need information from, but not really my number one or two priorities. So again, put things in perspective. Um, and oh, by the way, just, just before I forget that, this can get interesting. Okay, the, the general tab can get really interesting, especially when you talk about seasonal events. Super Bowl, um, you know, local weather, like <laughs> what we had today, uh, whatever it is, RS big conferences that people go to, these are considered gen general or generic, um, and, and we'll talk about the specific characteristics of those because they're predictable, they have a starting time and an end time, and you kind of know who's gonna be there from your organizations, from other organizations, so you can actually you know, mold some data and form intelligence from it around those events, around those generic or, or general events. Which leads us to how. And again, unfortunately, there is no ma magic silver bullet for this, all right? You can't just go out and say, all right, so I figured this out. Google, who is the biggest vendor <laughs> of them all uh, that I can buy stuff from? We'll get to that, all right? But first of all, you need to understand that a threat intelligence practice starts from within. <laughs> I'm feeling very zen today. Uh, you need to build that practice internally and augment it then with external capabilities based on what you need. And the key word here is OSINT. Uh, I'm not, again, this is not a talk about OSINT. You can have multiple of those in, in a day and you know, with some more to spare for a second day. Um, this is a link that where I maintain a short list of, of uh, open source intelligence uh, resources, which are, again, a bunch of links or PDFs 
they go into detail as far as geography and industry or and countries and languages, which is exactly what you need. Again, OSINT is not, let's Google for uh, who's attacking Ian today, right? <laughs> it's going to be a long list. Um, but as I said before, mostly industry-specific, geogra geography-specific, language-specific stuff uh, that you want to start looking at and get information from there, start correlating it so that you will have some kind of basis thread intel. And again, there's no vendor to do that. It's very easy. Run a Splunk inst instance, a few lines of code in Python or whatever it is, and, and you can start having real in interesting intelligence about you, that's relevant to you. Okay? Throw that generic stuff away. Um, which leads us, finally, all right, we talked about collection, we talked about where to get it, we talked about how, at that point, you should have enough data which is correlated, which is filtered, uh, which is relevant to your threat model, and at that point it becomes intelligence because it's, it's contextual. Uh, and let's talk about how, you know, how analysts, and, and I've proudly stolen this from a friend of my, mine, Wendy Nather, from 451 Research. Um, uh, and she talks about what is threat intelligence or, or the pyramid of threat intelligence. Um, so we start with the basic, okay, of data just, just sold separately. I don't like that, all right? My claim is this should be free because it doesn't really provide you a lot of value and you can do it yourself. On top of that, you have uh, the analytics of data that helps you make defensive decisions. All right, this is something that someone put some effort into to tailor it a little bit to your situation that turned the data into, that started turning the data into intelligence because when it feeds it back to you, it enables you to do something proactively and say, oh, I need to do something about this, all right? Again, beyond let's feed it back into my AV. And, uh, and network uh, detections. And then at the, the top of, of the pyramid lies what, you know, the, 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 what I call real threat intelligence, which is contextual data that you didn't have. Okay, and this is what you should be aiming for when you build that threat intel practice. It's getting on top of the game in terms of understanding what the next attack is gonna be. All right, how am I perceived by my attackers so I can change my defensive posture to improve my, or to lower my risk? That's the goal, all right? All the rest be below it, uh, again, from, from my perspective and my fairly young experience, again, six to eight years doing this in, in the field, uh, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for reputation scoring, attack tools, uh, threat actors, very specific information, in context, again, it's great to know that Dooku was targeting nuclear scientists in, in hotels in Dubai, great. I'm a Western in Indianapolis. <laughs> When's the next nuclear summit gonna visit here? Probably never, okay? Irrelevant, I don't care about that. Unless they're attacking like the Western network globally, which doesn't exist. Which leads me to the real, really understanding this slide, uh, which is kind of sad. Threat Intel has been out there since 2011, like as a buzzword, <laughs> not as a practice. Um, and this slide basically shows you that the, the uptick or, or the adoption of threat intelligence tools uh, or, or a buzzword hasn't been really stellar. Guess why? Because of this slide. Because most vendors, unfortunately, lie within these two layers of generic and maybe some correlation, some analysis, not really specific to your organization. And that's, that's, the, that's the tough sell. You know, organizations try to adopt, all right? They measure it quarter over quarter, year over year, and they say, well, we spent a few millions of dollars on threat intelligence because it's fancy and RSA, you know, everyone in RSA said that they're selling threat intelligence now but it really didn't help us. So you're seeing that red bar struggling to get in there and still 50% are 
you know, not even gonna, not, not, it's not in their plans to look at threat intelligence. So again, this is the self-bashing that, that we go through when we come up with a new buzzword and nobody buys it. Guess why? Because it doesn't matter, all right? Because again, we left the boffins in the lab to come up with something really cool and some, you know, some scripts that analyze a lot of different uh, IOCs and, and malware automatically and spit back a huge ton of MD5s and URLs that don't matter <laughs> from a defensive posture. So let's fix that. Now, let's talk about the real, you know, the, the, the actionable, part, actionable part of threat intelligence. And again, as, as a classically trained guy who spent some time in the army, we'll split it into three different, <laughs> three different elements. The first one is preemptive, the second one is reactive, and the last, but not least, is ongoing. So preemptive threat intelligence is basically knowing about something before it happens. And this is the cool stuff, all right? I know an event is gonna happen. I know that the, an attack is gonna meet my organization at a certain time with certain tools or techniques from a certain attacker, and I need to do something about it, all right? The interesting characteristic about this kind of intelligence is that it has a start date and usually an expiration date, okay? An attack is gonna start at two o'clock tomorrow, okay? You have 20 odd hours to prepare for that attack and do something about it, great. All right, that's threat intelligence, that's preemptive threat intelligence. A few examples like this is, again, is, is the known events. Super Bowl, March Madness, the RSA conference, uh, civilian uprising in Ferguson, New York, Baltimore, whatever it is, okay? You know this is gonna happen. You know that it, it's gonna have repercussions, and all you have to do is now map out, is that gonna affect me? If I'm the city of New York, hell yeah, it's gonna affect me, all right? If I'm the city of Oslo in Norway, hmm, probably not. Let the Americans deal with it, again. Same event, known event, different organizations, different threat intelligence. The second time is reactive, okay? You didn't plan for it, but it happened. Uh, good examples are, you know, uh, superfish, shell shock, heart bleed. Someone comes up and says, boom, I dropped it on your table, now deal with it, okay? Or again, an attack that happened on the Hyatt. Is it relevant to me as the Western here, all right? Is it targeting generic hotels in Indianapolis? Is it targeting really Indianapolis? Is it targeting the Hyatt? Understand how it relates to you as an event that happened and understand what am I gonna do with it now? Um, the, the interesting characteristics about it is that it has a start date because it happened, all right? Unfortunately, it's, it's in the past. Uh, most major events, have a short period where they're really applicable to you. Again, I'm sending 12 of my executives from the bank to RSA. Guess what? This is prime fishing season. <laughs> All right, they're gonna come back with a gazillion LinkedIn requests, okay? This is the time to get your, your uh, set in motion, your social engineering toolkit in motion, and start fishing them right after RSA. I know, you know, this is a, an event that's gonna happen uh, and start preparing for it. Um, the interesting thing is that it's, it has a long tail after it. Again, take shell shock, for example. Boom, it happened, everyone's vulnerable. Oh my God, the internet's broken for two days and then someone goes on uh, to another type of internet's broken. Short intention span. Uh, but people keep scanning for shell shock days and weeks after everyone patched. Okay, your threat intel should take that into account just to monitor new systems, okay? Just to monitor if, if, if I set up a new system and it's using an old template from before Shellshock, am I gonna put it up online before I patch it? I'd get dinged again, all right? It becomes applicable in your operations. Last but not least, ongoing threat intel. Uh, this is mostly your attacker-focused threat model derivative, okay? This, this threat intel comes in uh, 
mostly from focusing on, on your attackers. What do they do? Who are they after? Have they developed new techniques? All right, do they have new targets? Have they recruited new, or are they using other groups to do their biddings online? Again, this is ongoing. Um, good examples of like major or public threat actors in that field are ISIS, Anonymous, uh, the kind of stuff that you know is gonna is gonna hit you if you're the organization to be uh, to have those as your threat actors, um, and they're just out there all the time, amassing new powers, amassing new techniques, looking for new targets, reacting to news, reacting to events preparing for events uh, that apply to you. Uh, again, characteristic, characteristics here is that there's no start or end date. It's just an ongoing threat, and it's OK. It's your job. <laughs> um, most of the focus is going to be on refining your understanding of what their capabilities are, what's their accessibility, what techniques do they use, the tools, and so on and so forth. Which brings us, after going through and understanding how I'm categorizing the threat intelligence into three elements, into action. And this is the main key of this presentation. It is making this actionable. What do I do with it now? Great, I have all that data, but ma, I'm lost. Well, actionable threat intelligence is not just, <laughs> it's not just fancy UI on your, in your sock. Yes, it's great, uh, don't pay for it, put this on, this is threat, but oh, what the hell? Why is my presentation breaking again? Okay, um, put this on your sock, it's gonna make m way more impression than anything else that you can pay for, uh, and keep the real stuff uh, under the hood on a Splunk server or whatever it is. Actionable means creating alerts that can be addressed to the right people in your organization. Okay, actionable me does not mean having a new signature and deploying it to your endpoints or network protections. Okay, uh, an alert that is derived by, by threat intelligence uh, has a distance factor to it, all right? How far along is this attack? Has it started? Is it incoming? Do we have days, weeks, minutes? Is it five blocks away if it's a riot? All right, is it 5,000 miles away because it's, uh, it's some Chinese hacker in, the, uh, in Brazil or something like that, okay? It has a distance. It has the tool or the technique that's gonna be used. Again, if, if you don't have specifics, you can't really prepare for it. And if you, if, you, if, you, if you tell me, look, Ian, I can't get the specifics, then you're doing something wrong with your threat intelligence. It's not intelligence anymore. It's just random data. An alert should be able to go out not only to your technical uh, focal points in your organization. An alert might be more applicable to your legal staff or audit or financial. An alert a threat intelligence alert might be, oh, we found a bunch of database files with our financial records in some forum on the dark web, okay? And this is the first indication. It hasn't spread out yet. You think that the IT staff is gonna have something to do with it? Can they do something with it? No. They can do forensics to try to find out how it got there, but right now, this alert needs to go out to our lawyers, to our PR people, to our audit committee, and maybe marketing, so we can understand how to deal with it, okay? IT are way down there at the end of the, the totem pole. So again, think about alerts not as, how can I digest this back into my SIM, all right? Your SIM is probably gonna pop that alert if you did things correctly, and the next action is gonna be multiple parts of your organization. The best that you can get from a threat intel alert is what I call a preemptive incident response. It's the ability to understand that we're gonna go through an attack in 15 minutes, okay? Or we're gonna go through an attack in a day. 
or whatever it is. And I have the details of the attack. I have the tools. Maybe I can even analyze them to a point that I say, oh, I see how the attack is go actually going to happen. These are the packets that are going to be generated. This is the, the volume that I can expect. These are the targets. Especially if you're sitting on thousands of, of public IP addresses, and God knows how many DNS, uh, um, what's, what si what's the size of your DNS infrastructure, if you know what the targets are going to be, you can focus your security measures and your controls over those targets. Okay, and the opportunity to have a preemptive incident response and really do a full dry run. This is happening now. Okay, what do you do? And ask people, what do you do? This is happening now. We're under a DDoS attack. All right, you're, you're seeing, you're not seeing it, but you're seeing <laughs> uh, the CPUs spiking on these servers. All right, and this router is crashing and your website is not accessible. What do you do? and have everyone and everyone, not just IT, everyone run through that drill of what do you do now? Do we need to send a PR notice? Do we need to talk to our customers? Do we need to talk to our providers to escalate, to shift the focus? Do all of those and have a chance to deal with that attack before it actually happened. And, and again, I'm not just saying that, a lot of the examples that I'm kind of sprinkling in were from my experiences in the past eight months, okay? Dealing with DDoS attacks. Um, again, I published a white paper a, a couple of months ago. It's called the 16 minutes, the value of 16 minutes, uh, where we're able to identify an attack that were, was targeting a very small subset of a public infrastructure, uh, and we have identified that 16 minutes before it happened. Again, 16 minutes are a whole lot of time to run through an attack before it happened. <clears throat> Once you're able to handle the incident before it happened, do that, and then sit back and watch the value of threat intel really come into play. Because you're gonna face that specific attack, and as a defender, you're gonna be much more prepared to what you're about to experience, remember in the back of your mind that you will need to do some post-mortem analysis and see this is what I was ready for, this is what I actually experienced, and see what the difference is, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now this is great, and, and, and again, just by so far, uh, we're getting value out of Threat Intel, but we're greedy, so we want more. The 1%, I call it the 1% of threat intelligence, um, is really counterintelligence. It's when you get very specific about your attackers, about your threat communities. It's, a, it's when you have the right level of maturity that enables you to push the line of engagement further back away from you and into their territory. Uh, at that point, you can actually get counterintelligence and preemptive intelligence about their actions. Uh, these are a few examples from um, a couple of months ago. Uh, my employer is based out of Baltimore, and uh, as you know, Baltimore became a hot zone, and not just because of the, the TV show, um, with riots and stuff like that, and we as a social media company focused, you know, try to help the local government by identifying the miscreants, by identifying people who instigated a lot of the riots. Some of them were not even in Baltimore, all right? Some of them were, you know, professional internet trolls or uh, anarchists or whatever it is, but the ability to narrow it down and to understand who's causing what really quickly on your feet enables the local police to get better prepared, even physically, to say, you know, instead of, um, there's a burning CVS on this, this, and that, go to, oh, uh, people are talking about the burning some CVS and this, this, and that. How about, you know, sending a few police officers there to calm the situation before it, it escalates too much? Uh, another good example of threat intelligence, and this is, uh, this is from 2011. Uh, so again, uh, this is before the buzzword threat intelligence. Um, this is at a point where we're able to infiltrate a forum that we knew, uh, one of my customers, um, 
a very specific threat actor that applied to them was getting their tools and was, you know, kind of preparing the attacks and stuff like that. And at some point, we identified the release of a new rat, a new modified uh, remote access tool that was used for, for attacks. And um, we came up with the idea of, hey, we, let's say that hypothetically we can get access to that forum and change the content of what's being posted, okay? Hypothetically. What would you do? Don't take it down. I mean, that's gonna be too obvious. Uh, how about infecting the rat with itself? They're not gonna have an AV running with a signature of the rat. I mean, they're gonna use that. Uh, so it's not gonna trigger anything. And it's gonna be interesting to see who downloads that and runs that Trojan uh, or, or CNC or whatever it is, because once they do, we'll get the connection or someone else gets the connection and tells us, hey guys, someone's using that rat. That's a lot of information that's very, very specific to you because you know this was in a very specific forum used by very specific people for very specific reasons and someone just used that tool or downloaded that tool and executed it. Just by the metadata of what's coming in before we even get into the discussion of, oh, I can have access to their PC. <laughs> um, that's a whole different legal discussion. Just the metadata around that gives us so much threat intelligence, again, that we can prepare ourselves to a very specific attack. Uh, and, and again, things get really interesting at that point. You can create signatures, you can modify the tool to, uh, to generate very specific uh, traffic and have those signatures ready on your snort, okay? That's great, that's, that's a signature that applies to me specifically, all right? That my AV vendor or snort or whatever it is would have never picked up. Feedback loop. Uh, I kind of alluded to that before. Everything is great so far, but if you're not learning, if you're not identifying the gap between this is what my threat intel, my, you know, my, my big data geniuses in the lab told me that's gonna happen. And if you can't compare that to what actually happened and learned, learn why is there a gap between what my geniuses told me that's gonna happen and what really happened, if you're not in that feedback loop that enables you to refine your threat model because the capabilities of my attacker are different. They picked up a new skill. They have different access methods, okay? Maybe my, my collection should be tuned to pick up some new forums, all right? Or to look for different keywords or new sites. If you don't have that feedback loop, Again, you're wasting everyone's time, money, and resources. This is where metrics come into play, uh, and I keep, I keep mentioning that, but, but this graph, I love this graph. I'm a, I'm a big metrics fan. Um, not just the movie, just but the numbers. Uh, this is a, a way to measure observed versus expected. Again, this is where your threat intel score comes in, or events, and this is what you actually observed. In a perfect world, everything should be within this narrow band, okay? I expected this, I observed that. Great. But in a real world, you'll get those reds and greens, okay? Which means what I observed, the attack itself, was a little different than what I thought. And the key is to identify those long tails of red and green and say, all right, so what caused that? How can I improve what I'm expecting so I can be better ready for next time in terms of changing my controls, my processes, my people, whatever it is. So this is, you know, this is where it gets really interesting from our perspective as defenders where we need to keep improving on the data that we have. And I don't know if I mentioned that at the beginning, this is not gonna stop attacks, okay? There, again, there's no magic solution that says, oh, I have the best threat intel in the world and no one's gonna attack me, bullshit you're gonna get attacked. The question is how prepared are you? And how quickly can you go through that cycle to improve yourself and to make yourself a harder target for your aggressors? Quickly summarizing, hopefully we got rid of the FUD, all right? The minimum that I expect everyone to walk out of here with is the right arsenal, mind the pun, 
um, to talk to threat intel vendors, to talk about threat intelligence in general, okay? Uh, to be able to cut through the, the marketing buzz and the RSA stuff uh, and to really turn this into something actionable. And at the, at the end of the day, there's only one, one question that you should be asking anyone who's talking about threat intel. What's the action? What am I supposed to do with it, okay? And no, feeding it into your AV or, or URL filtering is not a valid answer, okay? Ask the question, it's very simple. Keep asking that, all right? That's how you, get, that's how you deal, deal with, with uh, uh, social engineers, I mean, salespeople. Uh, keep asking, what am I getting back from it, all right? If they can't answer that, your action is simple, don't pay. Build your own. There is no silver bullet. You will have to do hard, boring work. Why? Because it's your organization, and there's no other else like it, okay? Yes, there's a lot of other organizations in your industry that may have applicable elements because they work in your industry. Take that into account in the threat intelligence practice that you build internally. At some point, there's a limit to how much you can do yourself. And then you can say, all right, I'm willing to spend money on this and that vendor because it fits into something that I have identified that I could use, okay? Because they are, they're specializing in the threat communities that I have identified in my threat model. And they can fill in that information that I don't have the money, the resources, the language, whatever it is, to get. Pay for that, that's worth big money, okay? But don't just randomly buy threat intelligence stuff. And again, remember, this is a cycle, okay? This, if, if, if you cut the cycle at any point, you break your practice. There's no point of, of hang, having anything threat intelligence related or even threat modeling related if you can't keep improving on it and the key words are alerting, acting, and again, post-mortem, and, and keep feeding that cycle so you can keep improving. And the goal is to say, uh, and, and I had a great discussion a few hours ago with, with uh, Steve, who's probably not here, uh, because he got the talk before, <laughs> before you guys did. Um, let's take, a, let's take a, a cyclic event. You know, every year we get attacked by, you know, we hate banks because we're, we're a bank. Every year in July, we get this big attack and we're, we're offline for three and a half hours, okay? If you can turn that three and a half hours from last year into two hours this year, bam, you've got value. If you can turn it into four to five minutes next year, you have value. And you can only do that if you prepare for next year, all right? Not if you keep preparing for last year, because guess what? Last year they used tool A, they're not gonna keep using that. They're gonna find something else. Fancier, faster, more effective. If you don't have the threat intel to adapt and to know that about that in advance, you're gonna keep that three and a half hours probably growing up. That's all I have for you guys today. If you have any questions, this is the time. Thank you.